This week, we check out two cheeky, clever rolling robots. Johnny gets his groove on as he chats to Harmonix about Rock Band 4, and we find out some more about upcoming team-based shooter Gigantic. This is Player Attack. Hi, I'm Jessica Citizen, and this week we shed new tears over the cancellation of Silent Hills. It turns out that not only are we missing out on the talents of Guillermo del Toro and Hideo Kojima, but acclaimed Japanese horror manga artist Junji Ito was also involved in the project. We don't quite know what role Ito had taken in development, and it's unlikely that we ever will, but as the man behind some incredibly confronting, terrifying imagery, it feels like we're missing out on something potentially great. One thing we're not missing out on though is the Star Wars Battlefront open beta, which kicks off on October 8 and runs for just four days. The technical test contains three modes across three planets, the 40-player Battle Walker Assault on Hoth, 8v8 Drop Zone on Sullust, and Survival Mission on Tatooine, which you can experience alone or with a friend via co-op or split screen. It's open to everyone via Origin PC, PS4 and Xbox One, and if you miss out, there's not too much longer to wait. Star Wars Battlefront is out on those three platforms from November 17. And speaking of betas, the recent test for Rainbow Six Siege was so popular that Ubisoft had to extend its run for a few more days after eligible gamers were unable to log in due to high levels of traffic. That's not the interesting thing about the game though. This week it was revealed that the upcoming Tom Clancy title will not actually feature a story campaign. Instead, Rainbow Six Siege features several solo training missions and then focuses almost entirely on multiplayer, meaning that if you want to play alone, you will be paired off against bots. We've started hearing some very early rumours that Bethesda might be working on a sequel to last year's Wolfenstein The New Order. The story first popped up following an interview with the voice actor who played Anya in the game, who mentioned on Polish television that she was working on a new video game, following on from one she had already completed. She also mentioned that this game was at least two years away from release. Hey, a quick check of the actress's work history reveals she's only appeared in one game, paying BJ Blazkowicz's ally Anya Oliwa, so unless something is being lost in translation, it sounds like machine games might be keeping secrets from us. Coming up much sooner than that, we hope, is a fix for the PC version of Batman Arkham Knight. Warner Brothers hasn't given us any firm dates just yet, but has hinted that the game will be returning to shelves in the coming weeks. Now, this follows a significant game patch in early September, so while we still wouldn't hold our breath, it is looking quite positive. Even more positive, though, is the revelation from Ubisoft that Assassin's Creed Syndicate will be the first in the series to feature a transgender character. One of the game's quest givers, Ned Weinert, is a trans male, even though this is not directly addressed in-game. The developer explains that the game was designed, developed and produced by a multicultural team of various beliefs, sexual orientations and gender identities, so it's only fair that the game should reflect that. It is a bit of a backflip for Ubisoft, who came under heavy fire in 2014 for not including a female playable character in Assassin's Creed Unity multiplayer. This year, Assassin's Creed Syndicate offers both a male and female character for the main campaign, each with their own unique skills. A couple of interesting things out of Activision this week. First up, if you play Call of Duty for the single player campaigns, you need to have a modern console. The studio has confirmed that Black Ops 3 will ship for PS3 and Xbox 360 without a campaign mode, instead only featuring multiplayer and zombies. It seems the time has come where things are too technically complex to run on the older hardware, with developers unable to faithfully recreate the game's ambitious scope. Instead, the PS3 and Xbox 360 versions of Black Ops 3 will be sold at a discounted rate, and you will get a download code for the original Call of Duty Black Ops thrown in for free. Activision has also confirmed that it is starting its own worldwide esports league with a prize pool of up to $3 million in potential winnings. The Call of Duty World League is split into pro and challenge divisions, where challenge means amateur gamers can compete, with regional competitions held around the world. The first season of the pro division kicks off in January, with the first Call of Duty Championship taking place in the second half of next year. And speaking of esports, the Australian scene got a little bit shaken up this week as one of the country's longest running esports organisations, Team Immunity, was banned from League of Legends tournaments for two years after failing to pay their players. The decision came after several warnings from Riot Games, but team management was determined to have failed to meet Oceanic Pro League requirements and was unceremoniously kicked out. 
Happily, as the failure was clearly not the player's fault, Riot has invited all Team Immunity gamers to compete in the league under a new team name and has made sure they receive all outstanding payments for previous games. And finally this week, a quite delightful bit of movie news. Legend of Zelda co-director Takashi Tezuka has gone on record saying that if a movie was ever made from the games, he would like to see Link played by a boyish female actress. It's not clear whether Tezuka means a female actress playing a male character or completely revamping Link as a girl, but his partner on the series, Shigeru Miyamoto, doesn't seem to argue as Tezuka says a female Link would be very fun and awesome. Having watched a lot of Japanese series Monkey growing up, we have to agree. For more information on any of these stories, or to keep up to date with the latest gaming news, head to playerattack.com. But for now, stick around, got plenty more still to come. Aaron, what do we got this time? What's brand new? So we're excited to bring Rock Band 4 out. Uh, first and foremost, the thing that we're showing off is the freestyle guitar solo mode. Uh, so previously in Rock Band, it would just be like straight, straight beat match. You know, same five jam lane play that people are familiar with. Uh, and that's awesome. Like that gameplay obviously works because uh, people have loved it in the past. Uh, but we wanted to make sure that there was like some new and exciting stuff in Rock Band 4. Uh, and specifically with the freestyle guitar solo, we wanted to introduce something that lets people put their own creative spin on, uh, on guitar solos. So, uh, so it's no more beat match. It's a little bit more expressive, a little bit more creative. People can now make solos sound the way they want them to sound. You know, play it differently every single time if you want to. Show mode is another thing that we're super excited about. Um, previously in Rock Band, you would pick one song, back out to a menu, scroll, scroll. Oh, I don't want to play that. That's too hard. Let's change instruments. And it really kind of takes you out of that party experience. Uh, so with show mode, you finish the first song, and then you're given the opportunity to vote on what you want to play next. So you maybe get a prompt of like five different options. Say it's play a song from the 80s, play a metal song, song with female vocals, play a song by the Killers. And then you have to decide as a band in real time what you want to play. So maybe as a vocalist, I want to play, you know, a metal song. I love singing metal songs. But maybe if you're my drummer, you want to play something a little more laid back and you vote for the killer song. We'll then have to rally the rest of our band to vote to help break that tie. So it allows for a lot more awesome, like, inter-band dynamics, like, more communication, like, make it feel like you're working together as a group rather than just, you know, four single players who just happen to be in the same room together. And so this is built with a real big focus on multiplayer and just fun dynamic, right? Oh yeah, that's really where Rock Band shines, right? Like, the vast majority of people that play Rock Band play in their living room, in a group, in a party setting, uh, and so we want to make sure we're doing everything we can to support that group uh, of people who are, you know, having some pizzas, maybe having a few drinks, playing Rock Band, um, you know, that's, that's our bread and butter, and you know, as the only full band game coming this year, you know, that's something we're more equipped to do than anybody else. And an exciting word that everybody loves to hear, backwards compatibility. Rock Band 4 has this in spades, right? Yes, confirmed. That's something that we've been working on very hard for the last five years, uh, making sure that if people bought DLC for uh, previous Rock Band titles, that will carry forward to Rock Band 4 within the same console family. So meaning any songs that you bought for 360 will carry forward to Xbox One, any songs that you bought on PS3 will carry forward to PS4, and the same goes for hardware as well. So any wireless Rock Band instruments from the last console gen will be compatible with Rock Band 4 within the same console family. And a lot of people are big fans of the Pro instruments as well. Can we expect them to come back? Unfortunately not in Rock Band 4, certainly not at launch anyway. Uh, our focus really is on that core band experience. Uh, you know, Rock Band 3 was a pretty huge game, like it was absolutely enormous undertaking. Uh, and we're excited that we got to include keyboards and pro guitar. Um, but for, uh, for launch for Rock Band 4, we want to focus on, you know, our bread and butter, like the, the instruments that people know and love, that most people are familiar with and that most people are playing. Uh, and that's guitar, bass, drums, and vocals. And so how easy is this to just pick up and play with your friends? 
it's remarkably easy, you know? Like, we've got a lot of tutorials and onboarding stuff to help get people acclimated if they've never played Rock Band before. And if people have played Rock Band, the gameplay is familiar. It's, you know, the same game that people know and love with a lot of new exciting features as well, you know? We didn't want to start from scratch and throw out the old stuff. We didn't want to force people to buy a new instrument. Uh, like, we wanted to do everything we can to support people that have played Rock Band previously. Uh, and, uh, and it's been awesome on this main stage to see people hop up and try the new features like the freestyle guitar solos and take to it so quickly like people who are within seconds of playing it for the first time on their knees like shredding like crazy doing windmills and stuff it's it's been a great stage and as you said your bread and butter is the core elements of it what are we looking at for a track list in size this time track list we always try to approach as you know uh, like a harmonics mixtape uh, for our fans so we want to make sure that there's a variety of different songs from different genres and different decades um, you know we've got some like maybe some 80s uh, some 80s pop stuff like uh, like scandal uh, the warrior um, you know some heavy metal stuff like Avenged Sevenfold uh, you know for folks that want more challenging tracks uh, and then more modern poppy stuff killers Mark Ronson and Bruno Mars um, older stuff like Elvis Presley we're bringing him to rock band for the first time we've got the who another rock band staple they're the only band that's been in all four rock band games uh, so far we've still got you know, almost 50 different songs to announce uh, for the Rock Band 4 set list. So we're really happy with how things are shaping up so far. This is insanely eclectic. Oh, yeah. We always, you know, try to cover all our bases because, you know, a lot of people will like a lot of different things. And uh, we always try to expose people to maybe uh, different songs, uh, you know, things that they haven't heard before or maybe artists that they're not familiar with yet. So we'll have some emerging artists who are maybe just on the cusp of breaking it big. And then always, like, you know, the, the legendary acts, you know, first time to rock band and a lot of old returning favorites as well. As you may have noticed if you've watched Player Attack before, we are rather fond of remote controlled gadgets. We've played with little drones, jumping robots and a couple of nifty rolling toys and now we've got our hands on two more. Both are from US company Sphero and both are pretty awesome. Firstly, Dark Side Ollie. On the hardware side of things, this is a slick little black and red version of the device we checked out last year, a cylindrical rolling robot made of crash-proof polycarbonate. It'll zip around at 14 miles per hour, charges via micro USB and is controlled entirely by your smartphone via Bluetooth. And just like the original Ollie, Darkside is more fun in the great outdoors. Rugged tyres mean that it'll run quite happily on hard surfaces like concrete or bitumen and even on shorter grass. It won't go hunting through the wilderness for you, but if you find yourself in an empty car park or a tennis court, you are set. You can send Ollie up to 30 metres away and stay in complete control, and your phone is more than just a glorified joystick this time around. Once paired up, you can do all sorts of fun things using your handset. Trick mode means you can make Ollie perform nifty manoeuvres with just a tap or a swipe. It might take a few tries to get used to how it all works, but you'll soon be able to prompt Ollie to perform specky moves like a tiny skateboarder. But while the white and blue Ollie was a very well behaved little piece of tech, this darker brother is not. It's been designed with a more disobedient personality, which might not sound like something you really want in a toy, but rest assured that both versions of Ollie adhere pretty closely to Asimov's laws of robotics. The disobedience comes out if you leave Darkside Ollie alone for too long, and that time can vary. Rather than sitting patiently and waiting for you to return, this Ollie will start moving around without your input, performing tricks and basically trying to get your attention. On the flip side of this, Ollie is actually pretty responsive, as long as you give it something to do. You can teach it to follow simple commands using one of a handful of smartphone apps. In just a few taps, you can program the little robot to do things like move forward a certain distance, spin around, flash some lights or perform simple choreography. Given enough time, you can teach it to pull off some quite impressive performances, and this is a great way to learn the basics of programming. Rob Maigret from Sphero explains that we as a community have reached a point in technology where robots should be able to learn, they should be able to have a point of view, and they should be able to play with us rather than just the other way around. And that brings us to our second nifty gadget, BB-8. B-8 
BB-8 is the latest from the Sphero family, and yes, it is an official pocket-sized version of the ball droid that you see rolling around Star Wars The Force Awakens. Like Ollie and Sphero, which we looked at last year, it is controlled completely with your smartphone. This little guy has enough personality to make me feel uncomfortable referring to it as an it. He can perform tricks, respond to your voice, play augmented reality clips and wander happily around your house all by himself, and he does it all wrapped in a pretty adorable little package. There are diagrams online of just how the technology all fits together, but after spending a little while playing with BB-8, I'm pretty sure his head is kept on through magic, or maybe magnets. Beeping and chirping away, BB-8 is packed with personality. That shows clearly if you set the droid to patrol mode, which lets BB-8 wander around your house to see what he can discover. Be warned though, the droid can't see where he's going and doesn't have any sort of sensor to stop him from running into the walls. Instead, he will ram into them full tilt, but don't worry. On one hand, the polycarbonate shell is super tough, so he can't hurt himself, although his head might fall off. And on the other, he is actually keeping track of where he's been and what he's run into. So if you let him roll around for long enough, he will create a relatively accurate map of your living room. Of course, you can steer him around yourself via dual joysticks on your smartphone, which does take a little getting used to, but is pretty simple once you get there. You can also control BB-8 with a few voice commands, but we had mixed successes with that one. <laughs> Unfortunately, while BB-8 is certainly adorable, I'm a little disappointed that, unlike Oli or Sphero, he can't be programmed. He has his own bag of trips and he will run around by himself, but you can't teach him routines. And sure, that is only a little thing, but it feels like a missed opportunity. I mean, who wouldn't want to program a real, live Star Wars character? <laughs> The downside of both of these toys is unfortunately simple. They're not cheap. Dark Side Ollie will set you back around $200 from various electronics retailers, while BB-8 is another $50 bucks on top of that. If you want to recreate the remote controlled experiences of your youth, there are definitely cheaper options, and some of the RC cars these days are pretty impressive. But if you want something a bit different, a device that matches technology with personality, a piece of cinematic history, or a hands-on way to learn programming, it's definitely worth looking into one, or both, of these two. I'm Johnny Rebel here for Player Attack at E3, and we are checking out Gigantic. The art style itself is very, very striking. What, guy, what led you to make it like this? Yeah, so the art style, um, the kind of playful nature of the art style was really just a collaboration on the, on the art team itself to to really push it in that direction where it's like everything, you know, at the beginning of the game, everything started out a little bit less extreme and then the artists really pushed each other to like create this, this unique art style. The art style is very accessible so, you know, any any ages, you know, any playing background, you know, they really gravitate towards towards the game because it is very approachable. Like you see that, and you're like, I want to play that. It has a very broad fantasy style to it. So, were there any myths or real world legends that you drew through for the creativity part? Uh, yeah. So the art team really drew from basically all all sorts of things. So you know, when you look at a character, it's not like, hey, that looks like that. It's like that looks like this combined with that combined with that and it really allows us you know to create these characters that are inspired by uh, some things but they don't look exactly like that thing and that's really that's really the driving factor for the art styles like 
draw inspiration from everywhere, but really make it unique to Gigantic. So we talked a lot about art, but we haven't even talked about the game yet. Yeah. What's the game about? Uh, so the game is a five-on-five -five competitive PvP action game. Um, so it's all about killing your enemy's guardian. The guardian is your giant boss creature, so each team will have one. You can see it right there. Uh, it's that big creature there. So each team has, has a boss creature, and the goal of the game is to kill theirs before they kill yours. Uh, so you choose a hero from a roster of heroes. You jump in, and you're killing other the other team's heroes, and ultimately what you're trying to do is kill the other team's guardian. So you said you have a lot of different classes as well. How do certain classes play out? How do they work well as a team? Yeah, so uh, each hero that we have, uh, right now we have 16 of them. Each one is kind of their own class. Uh, so we don't necessarily have classes, but we do have kind of roles that they play. So if you play as the big beefy guy, you're going to be taking damage. Uh, if you play as the sniper uh, lady, you're going to be sitting in the back shooting people. But other than that, it's not really class-based, it's more uh, specific hero-based. So you have your hero, you have your suite of things that you do, and it's about using that uh, in the most effective manner that you can. Bouncing back to the visuals again, just because they're so striking, it seems very family-friendly. Uh, surely the, the gameplay as well, obviously, caters towards everybody? Uh, yeah, so it's rated teen, uh, but yeah, it's a very kind of playful art style. You know, we want it to be really accessible. Um, and so the gameplay as well is very kind of, it's definitely a deep game, it's a competitive game, there's a high level of play that you can achieve, but it's also easy to pick up and play. So, you know, this is uh, at E3, the first time that we're unveiling it on the Xbox One, um, so it works well with the controller, um, you know, you have your four main abilities and everything just maps really well, but it's also on Windows 10. So you can play it on your PC, you can play it on your Xbox, and really it's a it's an easy game to pick up and play. And that's about it for this edition of Player Attack. Thanks for watching. Next week we chat to Ubisoft about upcoming blockbuster Assassin's Creed Syndicate, while EA talks about what's growing in Plants vs Zombies Garden Warfare 2. In the meantime, you can catch us on playerattack.com. We're on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. And if you've got something you want to say, send us an email, mailbox at playerattack.com, or just hop on our forums. Till next week, I'm Jessica Citizen, and this is Player Attack.